Good afternoon, all you queers, twinks, pansies, faggots, skittles, dykes, and otters. Welcome to Flickr Theory Reviews. I'm your host, Tata Svinover. This is the first video of the mind-boggling series to come. These videos are meant to be educational, they're meant to be relevant, gobsmacking, and outright scandalous. I will discuss philosophical, political, psychoanalytic, and art-related topics of my interest. Why Flickr theory, you ask? These videos, like bouquets of critical prowess, will undertake to demystify symbolic, culturally produced structures that often are perceived as natural and self-evident. In fact, they're everything but. As Louis Althusser, Althusser says, we are culturally interpolated. So let us stir that culture up. Let us rise proudly from the slumbers of cultural habits, oppression, and dogmatism. As far as education goes, it doesn't necessarily mean that the viewer is going to be educated. More often than not, yours truly will be educated. This is a splendid way for me to cement my daily learning of the theoretical nitty-gritty. It sounds kind of boring though. I make videos for self-education. It's gonna be a doozy though. Also my friends and family often ask what is it that you're reading now? What is it that captivates you? What music are you listening to? What artists are you following right now? With the help of these videos I, I will surely transfer transfer that knowledge to you. So one of the major common threads among others of the video series will be queer, queer, queer theory. So what is queer? I'm, you know, I'm just gonna take you on a quick balloon ride over the queer since the video is about, supposed to be about Hockingham, nonetheless. Queer theory is is uh, enfant terrible of gay studies. It's like the avant-garde section of gay studies. However, I, I think that this attitude puts too much emphasis on the radical, far out, iconoclastic nature of the theory in question. And I think that's a bit of a miscalculation. There's nothing radical in there. For people like Foucault, Butler, Haraway, Gratz, Sixou, Hockingham themselves, the fundamental structures of gender identity are culturally produced. They are cultural and social productions that are a result of the political tides and developments. You know, we can even blame Zeus for this, who split, who did split, according to Plato at least the hermaphrodites into two because they were arrogant. What a bastard. So, just as there are conventional, established ways of enjoying brunch, watching TV shows, giving orders, taking orders, having dinner parties, playing video games, maybe listening to pop music, so there are conventional ways of being a man or a woman. Getting married, maybe. Purchasing king mattress, queen mattress. Uh, surely, maybe buying a family van. That is to say, a boy and a girl is constantly produced, cultivated. A boy and a girl is boyed and girled. At every step of the way, let's recall what Simone de Beauvoir, I'm just gonna be butchering these names, 
badly. Simone de Beauvoir, who says that one, are, one is not born a woman, but becomes one. If, however, one fails to act as a proper, authentic, real representative of the specific gender, one might as well be ostracized, excluded, shunned, and deemed queer. Queer. Then the notion of queerness becomes rather basic. I think it's rather basic. Queer is radical, far out, iconoclastic, insofar as the heteronorm heteronormative structure is dictatorial, tyrannical, undemocratic. Conse consequently, queer is supposed to be worn as a badge of honor. There's the slogan, which is rudimentary, yet I think it's revolutionary. It says, we are here, we are queer, get used to it. I shouldn't, however, shouldn't forget that today's topic is Hockingham's homosexual desire. If we were to prematurely discuss Hockingham's view vis-a-vis -vis the homosexual world, we stumble upon a his picturesque account of the queerness within the heteronormative world. He says the prosecution of homosexuality, I'm, and I'm quoting right now, the prosecution of homosexuality has its source in a homosexual desire. Whether they are passionate or scientific, all attitudes towards homosexuality are homosexual attitudes. When repression pursues a desire, it does so according to all accept acceptations of the term. It is obsessed about it, tries to attain it, it runs for it, and always lags behind. And it, and it determines it as its goal. So basically what, what Hockingham is saying is that Queerness is a quintessential, it's an essential part of the heteronormative society. There's this whole protective edifice of obsession that is constructed against the queer. Against the queer. Where's the queer? We should find the queer. Where is it? It is supposed to protect the heteronormative society from queerness, even though it only fetishizes it more. It's, it's, I think it would be interesting to just remember what Foucault said about Victorian age and how people really didn't want to speak about sexuality. So they created all these ways of protecting themselves from, you know, explicit material. And so they just fetishized it more. And it became so much bigger of a, you know, thing within their daily life. So queer theory attempts to debunk the stable allocation of sexes and genders. Since these were never stable at the first place, according to queer theorists. You know, if you think about Freud, and let's think about Freud for a second. In Freudian lingo, little boys and little girls, if you think about queer theory, are in a whirlpool, a whirlpool of mismatched genitalia and sexuality. In that case, a dipple, electra, problem doesn't mean anything anymore. A penis envy doesn't mean that much. It becomes rather vulgar. Mother as an original desired object doesn't mean that much either. It's just a form of sexism really. Castration anxiety is all passe really. It doesn't mean that much within the queer theory. At, at the very least these concepts take up a totally new meaning, form, and significance. According to Freud, the history of mankind started, began with the patricide, with a dipus complex, when the boys, you know, killed the father. And that implies that there was this stable allocation of genders at the first place. And the queer theory doesn't agree with that. They think it's culturally produced. That these are historic instances of ideology. So there's my spiel, 
regarding queer theory. The intention here is not to define queer theory, because I think the definition should appear as a byproduct of the videos that we're going to be making on the queer theory. I think that makes just more sense. So I'm just going to jump right into the topic of Guy Hockingham. Um, just pronouncing it the way I learned to pronounce it, and I'm proud of it. So Guy Hockingham, he was a French writer, philosopher. What else did he do? Uh, he was a journalist. Um, his book, Homosexual Desire, might be, it, it's considered to be one of the first works of queer theory. Thank you, Vicky, Wikipedia. Thank you. Ahiyam was also, as I said, a journalist. Uh, he was very much involved with the student riots of, of May 1968. He was influenced by Foucault, uh, Deleuze, and Gattari. Uh, DNG's book uh, called Capitalism and Schizophrenia is one of the main books that Hockingham himself was, was drawing on when, when writing Homosexual Desire. At that point, it was popular to critique Lacanian and Freudian interpretation of the psyche because it was all patriarchal nonetheless in many ways. Ahiyan is one of the people who critiqued it quite adamantly. All in all, this was a heck of a guy, a very important, challenging, yet very much neglected French theorist of the left. So let's jump, you know, into uh, Hockingham's text. I will focus on his article called The Screwball Asses. So, the Scruple Asses discusses the complexity with which homosexual desire is stricken. Hockingham describes capitalist hypocrisies, forms of sexual exploitation, as well as the profound intellectual uh, incompetence, you might say, that is festering within the homosexual elite. He starts this article with the dichotomy of desire and non-desire. Let's remember this, this is very important, desire and non-desire, as well as speech love and body love. Let's begin with the non-desire and desire. Uh, he addresses individuals with whom, at the beginning of this, of this article, he addresses individuals with whom he cannot have sex. This sounds very exclusive. Uh, he says, I wouldn't be writing this article and working on this book if I was able to simply enjoy sexual relationships, homosexual sexual relationships. In other words, homosexual desire is in shambles. It's, there's a predicament there. There's a, there's a aporia. If it wasn't so, if there were no problems with the homosexual desire, Hockingham would simply engage in the surplus pleasure. He would not write about it. He would just be mingling and, and having fun. That's what I think we do. The dichotomy of desire and non-desire is, 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 I think, nicely described by Freud and is beyond the pleasure beyond the pleasure principle eros and thanatos oh, okay, when I pronounce these words they just make me feel so smart oh my god such a, such a, wow. so what 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 Freud is talking about in his pleasure beyond the pleasure principle basically is that every living organism is looking for a way to attenuate um, the number of the stimuli that affect it. What does that mean? This is, well, basically this is how desire functions. It imagines, it imagines within every living organism, organism, it imagines a state in which one is at ease, comfortable, relaxed, carefree. You know, we work whole day and we, you know, imagine, well, at least we 
strive for, that moment when we're going to be able to sit on a sofa, uh, you know, crack open a cold one, and, and be relaxed. So we want to attenuate that, you know, number of stimuli. And that's what, uh, you know, Freud is talking about. However, this utopian state has to be a part of a personal meta-narrative. The way to achieve it, that utopian state of carefree enjoyment, th that way has to be proper, it has to be correct, sensible way. For it says, organism has to die, attain the state of no stimuli in its own way. Hence, we have that dichotomy that uh, Hockingham is talking about. A state of tranquility, this is imagined and craved for, and the state of meta-creation. A form of metonymy that postpones that state of tranquility. You know, the, the, the most obvious example, maybe a little archaic, uh, however, I think it's, it's appropriate. Think Petrarca and his love for Laura. He doesn't want to have his love answered because that would just spoil his whole, you know, work that he does, the poetic work. This would lead him to destruction of the poetic inspiration because he wants to write poetry, uh, you know, as long as she doesn't answer, doesn't do anything, as, she, as long as she is the femme fatale. One, she, if she was to actually answer his calls and, and say, well, I love you back, Petrarca, well, th that would be just, that, that would be ridiculous. It wouldn't make sense. It would there would be no reason for Petrarca to, wrote, to write poetry for, for Laura. Uh, this, so this cultivation of the meta-narrative, that's what you know, Petrarca is doing when he's, he's writing poetry for Laura and, and all these adorations and uh, exaltations of, of, the, of, the woman's, of the woman's image, that's what Hockingham calls the non-desire. And he obviously, he, well, that he, talk, he talks about homosexual desire. To quote Hockenheim, we only speak about sex. We only speak about sex with people with whom it doesn't take place. Let's think about this. For, yeah, I think it makes sense. The dichotomy of desire, non-desire is closely related to the, I think, to the dichotomy of speech, love, and body love. That's also something that Hockingham is talking about at the beginning of his article. Think about Zizek's article on courtly love. The medieval archetype of courtly love is, is functional insofar as the knight, you know, is able to distance himself from his actual, you know, <laughs> mingling, lo lovemaking with the princess. Is He sings songs, fights other knights, suffers and dies for the lady. Well, however, there's no such thing as body love. Nobody's enjoying body love. Nobody needs it. Well, you know, Hockingham needs it. And I think a lot of people need it. And Hockingham thinks that it's absolutely absurd. He thinks it's absurd that homosexuals can't overcome the obstacles lurking on the way to body love. They're always engaged in speech love, at least some of them, and nobody's getting to the body love, you know, to the canoodling that one wants to get to. I think it would be very uh, fruitful for us to remember the movie Being John Malkovich, hilarious movie, great, fantastic movie. If you haven't yet watched it, please do so right now. The whole movie is based on masquerading male protagonists. However, the protagonist himself is kind of superfluous, if you think about it. I mean, the, the jouissance or the enjoyment, that's the, you know, fancy French word for enjoyment, jouissance, that is attained, the bliss that is attained by the lesbian couple is totally impenetrable to the male subject within the movie. His, his logic just doesn't cut it, you know. In Lacanian lingo, lesbian couple, I think it brings forth us an instant of ineffable bliss and enjoyment, the jouissance, right? 
Hence, the male protagonist is engaged in speech love. It's constantly, you know, throughout through, through his, his masquerading, through hypocrisy, uh, uh, through this, uh, through the creation of, of narrative. He's engaged in speech love, while the lesbian couple is doing body love, and he just doesn't get it. And of course, he doesn't get it, and it's tragic. Again, when we are talking about the dichotomy of speech love and body love, also it would be probably useful to remember what uh, Freud had to say about art. Uh, if you are, as a person, engaged in culture making, or you are an artist, it's always about sublimation. So you sublimate the desires, the traumatic events, desires that are, are maybe savage and, and, and they're, you know, not allowed within the cultural civilized uh, uh, life you know for for it cherishes art you know because we always get the replacement product I mean if, if we, we, I create a good symphony or I, I, I paint a beautiful picture uh, it's it's a replacement for my for my you know repressed desires. so in a sense culture is a sublimation he says Freud says so if we think about body love, and that's what we are distinguishing here from the speech love, desire is is a blissful yet traumatic moment. And art is a form of sublimation. Art creates structures that are mere replacement products. In fact, whole culture is a mere replacement of the trauma. We focus on beauty and form so to distance ourselves from most savage of our desires. So in a sense that desire is a form of body love in its core. I mean, so body, lo body love is very often, as, as Hockenham says, is repressed and therefore we constantly are engaging in culture making that narrative, you know, the mode of, of narrative creation. Uh, and, and we never get to that uh, moment of, of body love. So, the non-desire, and I'm talking about, when I'm talking about non-desire, I'm talking about the need to, as, as, as Petrarca did, or, or in being uh, John Malkovich, the protagonist does, to create these um, obstacles on the way to body love, to create these poetic, you know, meta narratives, which somehow put that body love into a framework however you actually never get that body love and so the non-desire that kind of a non-desire for Hockingham it's it's everywhere it's you know festering and and and, and it's like a Pandora, Pandora's box he, he describes the types of you know people that refuse the homosexual desire. He says white collar bourgeois people, they don't like to talk about homosexual desire. Immigrant workers don't like to talk about homosexual, homosexual desire. Leftist students also don't like to talk about homosexual desire. Am I, am I included here? Am I the leftist? For Hockingham, the inability to desire or the refusal to speak about desire is inscribed by capitalism. So whenever somebody says, I don't insist it, I, I don't want to have anything to do with homosexual desire, Hockingham uh, thinks that it's inscribed by capitalism. It's very critical of capitalism. He doesn't like capitalism. Hence, I think since uh, the non-desire is so ubiquitous, <laughs> he understands that to speak about the refusal is, is pointless. It's futile to go you know, down the street and talk to people about it. He thinks he has to write about it. He invents a concept of screwball homosexuality, which describes the revolutionary homosexual movement that falls prey to pure theory. In order to overcome pure theory, speech love, non-desire, obstacle making, he has to write it down. He has to write a man, you know, manifest for for revolutionary homosexuality. He wants to imagine 
the revolutionary homosexuality which escapes pure theory and non-desire which is about enjoyment and about sexual liberation and that's very important to him because it has to be about liberation as i said talking about this with people for him seems rather pointless it doesn't work anymore the non-desire is just too uh, ubiquitous it's overwhelming it's all over the place it's it's inscribed by capitalism 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 then well then Hockingham goes on to describe two other issues that are relevant to him the, al the alienation of homosexual elite and the necessity of shadows or spaces within within <laughs> within margins <laughs> when enjoying homosexuality Hockingham tells two stories one of them has to do with a group of homosexual intellectuals who can <laughs> apparently who can only communicate through their intellectual bonds and shared political past um, these intellectuals that he's describing were most of them members of the homosexual uh, front of revolutionary action in France they meet to discuss a book homosexual desire that's the story that he's telling after some crafty <laughs> brisk deliberation one of the homosexuals says and I'm, and I'm quoting right right now it seems to me that we cannot speak about this book and they were talking about I think uh, Hockingham's book uh, homosexual desire they say it seems to me that we cannot speak about this book without first addressing the homosexual desire that exists between us and knowing how it circulates or does not circulate in this room <laughs> so for Hockingham this is a uh, most stupefying it's a uh, hot with, with, although it's an honest example of self-censorship these homosexuals cannot enjoy body love and I think Hockingham is included amongst it's, he's one of one of the homosexuals that he's talking about they cannot enjoy body love since everything they share are political intellectual bonds these transcendent bonds and they cannot do body love making they cannot talk about it because it's it's a taboo so basically they cannot marry their political agenda with their bodily needs so that's one of the issues that he's talking about i think that's the way he's describing the way that intellectuals uh, elite uh, homosexuals are alienated from their immediate needs and immediate well interests the other story that he's describing unfolds in Ecole du Ecole de Buzard, <laughs> where each Thursday at 8 p.m. homosexuals used to uh, come together uh, to express their desire for political uh, struggle and, and sex. One time a boy at Buzard takes Hockingham by the hand and leads him towards an obscure passageway. The boy takes him to the toilets of, of Buzard. How many times am I going to have to repeat Buzard? I, I just like it. I just like to pronounce it Buzard. All right, whatever. They, they f so what happens when they uh, see the toilet? They find a half dozen bodies here, uh, basically, you know, and laced in, in all kinds of complex circuitries. The smell of the urine and the visual image, uh, the, uh, presumably the bodies are naked, uh, visual image forces Hakim to recoil. He's disgusted. However, he's ashamed of being ashamed. He was, and it's really sad what's happening. He, he, he immediately says, it is as if homosexual desire could be inscribed where repression has inscribed it. Described it. That's what Hockingham says. He knows how many queers only have toilets in which to touch each other. It's so it's a really a sad situation for Hockingham. It depresses Hockingham that those who came out who said, "Yes, we are homosexual, we are gay," and they came out out of the closet. Nonetheless, continue to project their excitement 
in miserable, d- disgusting places. Uh, again, to quote Hockingham, uh, suddenly I turn fascist <laughs> and want to chase the queers from their tea room with a whip. They can only enjoy themselves in darkness. Uh, that doesn't make sense at all to, to hug him. So here, basically, we have a case of uh, a case in which desire becomes boring, deplorable, when it is rendered appropriate or explicit. Think, remember what Georges Bataille, Georges Bataille, said about taboo and transgression. Taboo is just a productive way of, of living, of, of having your routine, uh, uh, while, while transgression is a form of play. Uh, transgression is the way through eroticism you are able to play, experiment and get to something really exciting within your sexuality. So that's what Hockingham says and basically he's referencing that I, I mean, I mean, I don't think that he necessarily wants to critique everybody who wants to enjoy uh, sexual relationships in, in miserable places because that's probably for some people it's it's part of the part of the part of the deal. But he says, if if everybody's doing it, it's just a sad situation because we are, you know, coming out. We are saying this. Yes, we are gay, but we just immediately as we do that, we go back to our dark, you know holes and, and toilets where we can enjoy ourselves in that way. It doesn't make sense for Hockingham. Hockingham for Hockingham it is unfortunate really that queers just can't engage in that world of play in well lit places. The, the world of play that, that Georges Bataille is describing. And, and, and to quote Hockingham again, uh, desiring machines brought the bodies together and then shut off the electricity, which is <laughs> it's a comic way of thinking about it, but it's, I think it's really paints a rather good picture. Then Hockingham goes on to describe another problem with homosexual desire, capitalist exploitation, and which is real. Homosexual relationships uh, you know, for, to, to, for, for Hockingham, just like all other forms of relationships, are not, you know, they're not impervious to capitalist society and, and, the, and, its, tendency, and its tendency, basically, uh, to, to harvest bourgeois proletarian exploitation. Hockingham admits that even homosexual desire always reverts around exploitation and spectacle really he uses he uses an example of members of french homosexual bourgeois who travel to exotic countries in order to get sodomized by the exotic macho arab this is one of the particular examples that he's going to be utilizing in order to show how within homosexual desire there are forms of exploitation that are very much alive this that relationship exploitative relationship the exploitation of the proletariat in the sense for the gay bourgeois bourgeois man who is interested in, in going to a country like Morocco and and getting sodomized by the exotic male Arab this this romance begins somewhere deep in the Morocco where one can, you know, mingle with the admirable Arcadian shepherd, you know. <laughs> but then this bourgeois gay man will come back home to France and tell that story to his, you know, gay friends. And it's all a big spectacle. It's all a big show. And it's kind of disgusting. However, it's it's bad because it's it's exploitative. It's a form of racism, and and what 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 Hakim is talking about is that this coming back to France is inevitable for the bourgeois man that is, and it represses something of value to us. Exotic Arab is exotic, insofar as he's abandoned 
in his lamentable basically dwelling somewhere in Morocco so the spectacle of the attractive Arab works only in distance in Morocco uh, the admirable proletariat macho man that is exotic it, it could be you know attractive because it's a, it's a ideal romantic story to tell other homosexual men in, 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 in the privileged Paris, uh, pri privileged circles of per Paris whereas in Paris if that Arab would come to Paris he would just immediately become a sub proletariat the, the, a base subject and Hockingham imagines when he imagines such homosexual bourgeois proletariat liaisons he depicts these rather picturesque dialogues so bourgeois man says the bourgeois exploits you my father exploits you so fuck me <laughs> doing this in my country would be sordid but in your country in the bushes it's so wonderful <laughs> having this experience in mind for Hockingham revolutionary homosexual campaign is impossible if Arab was to begin his sexual revolution he would be totally excluded from sex hence I mean there can be no uh, misunderstanding racism still is enacted sexually Hockingham for one you know sadly can't even imagine how this racism could be wiped out so the racism is, is sediment is sedimented it within the sexual intercourse it's there it's functioning and that's what Hakim says it's 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 regrettable then he goes on to stress one other problem just alienation of homosexual people Hakim says that pleasure is radically it is radically separate separated from confrontation of people the homosexuals he's referring to try to segregate pleasure from communication they segregate pleasure and communication when homosexuals uh, stop, stop talking about the, the desire they only want to engage in erection you know machine like in human basically interaction which is always based on exploitation Hockham says that capitalism just doesn't leave a lot of pathways for uh, to homosexuality there's only the exploitative form of it the one that we had in mind when we talked about the, the exotic Arab or flight and masquerade non-desire the constant you know uh, <laughs> metonymy the production of narrative that distance the subject from the body love that we want to get to at some point right for a person like Hockingham this is a, this is a sad situation he postulates uh, he postulates a revolutionary form of homosexuality which is humane and is based on sexual liberation A lot of time for Hockingham, homosexual desire is still caught up in uh, capitalist practices. This for him is, is absolutely regrettable. Hockingham continues to critique homosexual queer desire by describing heteronormative structures that are still so powerful within the queer mentality. He doesn't get why some queers play queens for example act as women pretend to be a girl according to Hockingham if he was to play a queen he would be only unveiling the masculine masks of women in other words he thinks that feminine quality is is is, is defined by patriarchal system so every attempt to repeat it, to reiterate that you know archetypal <laughs> feminine subject, uh, no, but I'm just saying, the, the Goethe's uh, eternal feminine, they, they would, uh, would be 
a form of submission to that patriarchal system. For Hockingham, being a woman means so much more than 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 coquettish chatter and sassy gesturing. While all sexual activity corresponds to the sublimation of homosexual interests for bu- for bu- public good, we must, says Hockingham, you know, admit that this is also this also applies to gays, regardless of how comic the cons- consequences might be. You know, prohibition of fraternal incest is latent in homosexuality as well. You know, he says that those who walk, those those who talk about revolutionary homosexuality, don't sleep together. You don't. You know, you simply don't mix apples and oranges. That's that's what he says. Homosexual desire is also basically based on exploitative exogamy. And so, in many ways, the homosexuality is constantly also engaged with the same exploitative forms, the same exploitative reciprocities, the same hypocrisy, the same, you know, masquerade. And, and that's a sad thing for, for Hockingham. Finally, Hockingham discusses the forms of repression directed towards homosexuality. For Hockingham, uh, the repression of homosexuality is riveted. It's riveted to the desire it is chasing. For this, you know, desire haunts it. So if we imagine a modern society, the, the, the desire, homosexual desire, constantly haunts it. Even within even within the homosexual elite, as we discussed before, there are forms of oppression directed towards body love. It is as if proletariat can enjoy sexual relations by using the totality of the body in all inclusive, visceral way, while bourgeois can only mechanically recite homosexuality. It could never invent liberate sexuality. Bourgeois homosexuality can never liberate sexuality. That's what Hockham says. This was basically the end of my spiel on, on Hockham and his article Scruple Asses. I hope you liked it. <laughs> Life is too short to read bullshit. Hockingham is a phenomenal, witty, and original writer. I hope I was able to articulate exactly that. And remember Kislovsky's A Short Movie About Love? Well, it tells a story about a boy that falls in love with the older woman. He's very voyeuristically engaged with her. When she finds out, he she tells him that, that there's no such thing as love. You shouldn't, you know think about those things, those schmaltzy things. There's just a sex. There's just nihilism and sex. And well, it's a tragic moment for the protagonist boy, and he wants to commit suicide and, and all the rest. However, even though it's tragic, it's also enlightening. Hockingham similarly enlight- enlightens us. He tells us something absolutely crucial. It is not enough to engage in radical forms of sexuality in order to disavow common problems of sexual intercourse. The problems of erotic capitalism, capitalist exploitation, masquerade, hypocrisy, production of spectacles, as well as forms of flight from desire are nonetheless there. If we were able to fight those, we could imagine a revolutionary sexuality called screwball sexuality that he wants to <laughs> screwball homosexuality that he wants to entertain as a possibility wherein one is humane liberated free-spirited subject as simple as that thank you have a great day i'll talk to you later